Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Tahil Sharma, and I'm the Regional Coordinator for North America at the United Religions Initiative, which is the largest network of grassroots organizations around the world. Um, all of you in the room already know much about URI because of your previous involvement. Um, but today we're having a really fascinating conversation um, that started off with a couple of folks speaking aside from myself, but due to extenuating circumstances, they dropped at the last minute. And when I mean last minute, also a couple of hours ago. <laughs> so I had to restructure some of this conversation today, but this is gonna be an important opportunity for us to engage with some of the topics um, that have been really relevant in some conversations I've been having with cooperation circles here in North America and in other regions as well. Um, so I'm excited to be able to present that. And I'm actually going to start off with a question to everyone. Um, if you'd like to each introduce yourselves because we're a small group right now, that would be great. Um, and also to let us know where you are, who you are, and what do you know about this topic of religious nationalism? Um, so I'll popcorn it around. You don't have to have the greatest knowledge about it. It's just a general question. There's no right answer. Um, so I'll start off with Patrick, please. Yes, um, I am Dr. Patrick Horn. I have been involved with the Unity and Diversity World Council since 2009. So this is 15 years of being involved in the interfaith movement. Um, this is a, a, an interesting topic. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I was uh, studying English and I was recruited by the intelligence community to study the intersection of religious doctrine, economies, and global security, especially <laughs> focusing on storytelling narratives for social mobilization, conflict resolution, and peace building. And in the long list of questions, uh, one of the things uh, that they uh, asked me to study was the construction of threat, meaning the word threat, uh, uh, how media constructs threat, how government and intelligence agencies construct threat. Uh, and so when I saw the title, The Threat of Religious Nationalism, I thought, wow, here's five words and three of them are problematic. What is threat? What is religious? What is nationalism? You know, the only words that don't seem to be problematic in that title are the and of. Uh, and so uh, there's, of course, common understanding of, of those things, and there, there's more nuanced understanding. So I'm really looking forward to having an interesting uh, dialogue, learning a lot, and, uh, and uh, glad to be here for the conversation. Thanks so much, Patrick. Appreciate your presence and oh, some of the I'm prior sorry. knowledge you'll be bringing in. Oh, yes, Patrick. I, I forgot to mention, since you asked location, I am in Pescadero, California, which is a small town on the south coast of the San Francisco Peninsula in California. Great. Appreciate it. Biff? Uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Biff Barnard. I've been involved with URI in various capacities for about 20 years. Uh, and I'm very much uh, looking forward to learning more about uh, religious nationalism from you all. And I'm in I'm in Walnut Creek, California, which is just east of San Francisco. Great, great. Thanks, Biff. Reverend Yuel. If you want to unmute yourself, please. Uh, I am Reverend Joel Bhatti from Canada. My journey uh, uh, with the URI is very long. <laughs> uh, since its birth in Pakistan, uh, I've been working as a, a volunteer, thereafter a CC coordinator, there, thereafter MCC coordinator, and uh, ultimately I served 10 years for Executive Secretary of United Religion Initiative in Pakistan. So we created our many CCs over there, and uh, the impact of URI will spread uh, all over the Pakistan. And they love it uh, that uh, 
energy of that uh, URI and the aim and objects and the PPF of uh, URI. So there are certain more uh, interfaith organizations uh, uh, come into the exist. That's wonderful. So uh, ultimately, I have to move in uh, Canada uh, in 2016. But my work was started uh, with a group of uh, a better community for all uh, Canada. Meanwhile, side by side with the Pakistan also. But then uh, we focused that. In August 2022, I became our CC became the part of uh, North America, and uh, I appreciate uh, the services of uh, our uh, uh, Tahil Sharma sir. Uh, he's a very capable for uh, us and guidance and everything. He's so friendly. And meanwhile, I've been uh, also co uh, attending many meetings of co-creators. Uh, uh, I know that uh, uh, that lady, she was, she was here, and uh, I love to uh, uh, start, continue the journey of interface dialogue for peace till my end. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> Thank you, uh, UL Top. Appreciate your introduction. Um, to now introduce the Bob part of Noel and Bob. Bob, if you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm Bob Warner. My beloved is Noel Marshall. We live in uh, Northeast Tennessee. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, between us, we have four hands. So we have uh, probably eight or 10 hands in different parts of our lives and circles that we uh, operate in. Uh, we are um, not retired, but rewired and refired and try and continue to every day to see what our gift is to, um, to benefit humanity. Um, we're connected to URI in that uh, there was a very long-standing URI cooperation circle in this Northeast Tennessee area, uh, which fell into inactivity and aging out probably five years ago, uh, tried to res resurrect it for a couple of years, and uh, have dissolved that cooperation circle due to a lack of local interest in participating. Uh, we traveled for 10 years um, uh, in our RV home between 2010 and 2020. And uh, we're students of Barbara Marks Hubbard uh, until and ever since her passing. And the Co-Creators Convergence, which is uh, the logo that you see in front of you is a non-organization, a collective community, which support each other in answering their question, what is my gift to the shift in humanity? Which was Barbara's big question for all of us to consider. And we consider ours every day we're also involved in um, uh, Unitarian Universalist. Uh, it has a um, very active congregation in this area. Uh, Noel was just today elected to the board of directors as vice president, and um, uh, I've been running the social, uh, uh, chairing the social justice committee for the last three years. We're very active in this area in a whole lot of ways, uh, and as it connects to the subject of the day. Uh, oh, by the way, one of my other hands is I'm the vice president of a Catholic worker house in Wisconsin, of which I have a board meeting starting that I have to run in about a half hour. But um, uh, that Catholic worker house and the Catholic worker movement has um, a lot of connection to this subject of national uh, of racial, uh, excuse me, um, uh, religious nationalism. And in our area in Tennessee, uh, I would put we ended up here uh, when my mom passed buying her house so we ended up in this area which means we ended up in a state what i which i would arguably put at the top of the list of the most undemocratic states in the country uh tight freeway race with texas and florida primarily and um, everything that happens in our state legislature is done by folks who are not representing the citizens of this state this state and uh, religious nationalism. In fact, our state legislature last week officially made the Bible the official book of the state of Tennessee, an attempt that's been underway every state legislature for 10 years. It was signed by the governor last week. So that gives you just a hint of what it's like in uh, life in Tennessee. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm going to have to beg off. I don't know if Noel can come back from her other call and join you, but I'm glad this is being recorded um, because the subject's very, very important to us, and I want to share 
uh, what I learned, what we learned from this uh, interaction with the folks, uh, particularly the folks at our church. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Much appreciated. Nasrinji, please. Unmute, Karle. Yes. English is not very good as <laughs> you guys, <laughs> but I think uh, you understand my simple English. Yes, uh, absolutely. I am <laughs> recently started with work with uh, Yoel Bhatti uh, as a program coordinator, uh, Better Community for Canada and Pakistan. I have I have so many desires in my heart to work for people for better health, education, and uh, prosperity. Uh, I have so many dreams to fly uh, <laughs> like a, a very big wings uh, because uh, people are very tough life uh, in Pakistan, especially, and India. And uh, when I saw uh, the people are uh, suffering uh, so many problems, that's why uh, uh, I have very heavy heart. And I want to do uh, for uh, better for them, but I have no force. Mm -hmm. But I have only God. He is my God. He is my love. And uh, his love is still a full uh, my heart. Uh, so I serve my service for people, uh, poor for people, uneducated people, and uh, uh, people uh, not deserving uh, good things like education, health, and uh, no home, no clothes, no good food. Uh, and this is my uh, uh, better understand what I say. Mm -hmm. I, I want to do uh, for poor people, and uh, I, I, I am also very poor. <laughs> Because I live in Pakistan, mm -hmm. uh, that's mm -hmm. why I uh, I love one every person who Muslim, who Christian, who Hindu, every person I love him, I love them because they are human beings. First thing mm -hmm. they are human beings, and after that he is religion. Thank you so much, Nasrinji. Uh, yeah. introduction ke liye baat baat very, yeah. very thankful for your introduction. <laughs> you understand my English? Hanji, Hanji. Hanji. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Nay, but uh, we completely understand. It's it's quite late in Pakistan right now. It's about. <laughs> it, it's it's just around uh, a quarter to two or two fifteen in the morning. Um, so yeah. it's very kind of Nasrinji to join us at this time while she's feeling exceptionally thank tired. <laughs> thank you so much to hear me and especially. Oh, of me. course. Oh, of thank course. No, no problem at all. Um, but yes, let's jump right in. Um, I don't want to, you know, take this opportunity to, there's always a time for us to connect, you know, in the social way, but I want us to be able to jump right into a very important conversation. So let me just share my screen. Okay, there we go. Perfect. And let me slideshow away. So the main premise of having this conversation, um, not just between us as a um, community, but us as an organization called the United Religions Initiative, um, is rooted in this larger conversation about the idea of nationalism. The specific topic of religious nationalism has been researched for decades, 
but it's been being noted around the world through political parties, violent fringe groups, and even larger populations of people in the 21st century. Um, and for the context of the United Religions Initiative, our mission is to call for enduring daily interfaith cooperation, to end religiously motivated violence, and to create cultures of peace, justice, and healing. Since we unite in responsible cooperative action to bring the world and values of our religions, spiritual expressions, and indigenous traditions to bear on the economic, environmental, and political and social challenges that face our earth community. So it's very important for us to really consider the ways in which we're engaging a topic that's very heavily motivated by modern day politics, but a certain response to a larger form of patriotism which we'll get to learn about in just a minute. The idea of nationalism as a whole is that it's a principle that holds that the political and the national unit should be congruent. So this idea that it's actually just an extra step above patriotism. The idea is that you have a love and an admiration for your country, your people, your culture, your norms, but it actually takes it a step, step further and it actually brings up these sensations of pride that create exceptionalism or this idea that your country, your culture, your norms are unique from everyone else's. Um, and in, in some ways for those that have that opinion that they're better than other people and other countries. Um, and oftentimes this nationalistic identity has a tendency to narrows one understanding of who or what can be identified as a part of quote unquote, our nation. Um, so the idea that, you know, specific countries may have this understanding that a single religion, a single type of person, a single norm may be able to include you or qualify you to be a part of the country, whereas certain identities or certain backgrounds may not be considered. And nationalism tends to be rooted in a superiority complex, rooted in origin stories that affirm uniqueness of a specific idea, practice, or identity. So oftentimes um, we look at nationalism as a way to be able to really give people an extra boost of energy to support a cause. Um, and some of that is rooted in some of these stories of understanding how our countries came to be as nation states in the modern day, or how they were rooted back as a united people going back hundreds, if not thousands of years. And oftentimes those stories become the inspiration for a new narrative around understanding and connecting with nationalism. And because it has a very systemic and a cultural nature of impact, it has, it has had historically positive and negative consequences on the development and progress of nations around the world. Um, depending on the communities that you go into, the term nationalism has an important nuance. It can be taken with a positive connotation or a negative one, depending on who you talk to. Um, and the extent to which that nationalism is really practiced also really depends because one's identity around one nation really differs depending on the person that you talk to. It can be really inclusive. It can be really exclusive. It can be really peace loving. It can call for violence. It can do a lot of things in between as well which makes this idea of nationalism so complicated. Um, as Patrick was mentioning earlier in the call, the nuance of this term is so important depending on who you talk to. Because when you take a term like nationalism and put a connotation of fear to it because certain fringe groups or groups that call for violence are calling for nationalism, you feel like it's not a good place for us to be in. It's not a good place for us to be connected. Whereas those who have found the term nationalism to be a rallying call for them to call for liberation and freedom from oppressors may use that same term and it may mean something completely different to them. So it's very important that we consider that sort of factor, that nationalism as a general idea has a both positive and negative connotation. It doesn't necessarily mean one thing. It all depends on who you talk to. So now we go to the specifics of religious nationalism, which is sort of the theme that we're going to be addressing today on this call and in this conversation. Um, Grismala Boos, who is um, an, uh, an up-emerging uh, 
academic who's talked about this, um, talks about the fusion of religious and national identities and goals, asserting that there's a congruency between that which is national and political, which is sort of the general idea of nationalism, and uniting it with religiosity, sort of connecting it with this bigger idea of um, what religion represents and the role that it plays in a society. And there are actually two different types of religious nationalism. Um, there's a religious nationalism that focuses on an ethnic identity, one that's more often associated with people and land. So it's really talking about politicizing the role of religion in a society. And then there is the kind that informs a political order, one that's more attached to ideas and beliefs, and the larger idea of actually religionizing politics. So trying to actually think of implementing and interpreting ways that religion plays a role in political life and the way that we understand things like law and order, um, equitable coverage in society, that kind of thing. Nations are not inherently religious and religions are not inherently nationalistic. So we have to make sure we understand that really clearly because oftentimes we conflate this idea that because a country may call for having a specific religion, that it's assumed that all of its people are religious, all of its people agree with that practice of the religion as being a part of law and order. That's not necessarily the case. And all religions are not inherently nationalistic, meaning that not all people who practice these religions have this inherent idea that their interpretation of religion and how it works in the world of politics should be the way that it works for everyone. But it is a very malleable structure, this thing we call religious nationalism. Um, and it's malleable enough to adapt to the worldviews and political systems of various communities. We're actually seeing it show up a lot at this moment um, in a lot of different ways that we understand the role of religion in society right now. Um, we as an organization that focuses on daily enduring interfaith cooperation understand the complexity of religious identity and that not all people actually follow the same structures, the same ideas, or the same beliefs around their religiosity and their relationship to life and society. But the fact of the matter is, is that religious nationalism is playing a very, very powerful role at the moment in terms of conversations that are going on every day. The first country, uh, the first region, as an example, is the conflict that is going on currently in Israel and Palestine. Um, one that is rooted in a lot of historic precedent of who is claiming indigeneity towards a land, and where there's a religion, there's a relationship to a religious precedent in the relationship to that land. And in this case, we are talking about sort of this larger conversation between Jews, Muslims, and Christians, who all have some sort of deep relationship to this holy land where, it, where Jerusalem is, and whoever decides what the geopolitical border of that area is. Um, we see this in the case of Afghanistan, where currently the Taliban is ruling, um, that rules under a specific interpretation of Sharia law. Uh, we see this as an emerging conversation in India, uh, where the current ruling party has had conversations or leaning tendencies uh, towards Hindutva or Hindu nationalism. We see this conversation coming up in Myanmar or Burma, where Buddhist nationalism is taking, taking a narrative precedent and is, you know, for the last decade or so, has led to a lot of the marginalization and oppression of the Mian, of the Rohingya community in the country. Um, we see this in even in countries like Japan, where it is super subtle, but certain strongholds of um, Buddhist and um, Shinto communities have a very deep and lasting impact on the, the political bend of the ruling parties and their ability to really focus on who should be ruling, how should they be connected to the royal family, and what are the takes sort of following World War II. And finally, one significant example that we're going to get to examine a bit more today is sort of this relationship of religious nationalism to the United States. Um, this has been a conversation that's been 
in and out of, you know, political spaces for quite some time. Um, it's ruled by a lot of different narratives, um, ones that we'll get to talk about in our discussion in a little bit. Um, but I'd like to, you know, really help us think about just this larger understanding of what does religious nationalism look, look like since it's so flexible, it can adapt to a lot of different things. Um, and it's hard to narrow down a specific list because the role of religion in society and the role of politics in society can both be super impactful. And therefore, when you create a narrative like religious nationalism that seeps into different parts of politics and culture and norms, we then tend to see that there are a lot of different ways that religious nationalism can sort of take its role to, um, to develop. So you will see it in some, uh, this is just a short list out of many examples that are out there. Um, language that associates a country in deep inseparable roots from a freight tradition or identity. This idea that you know, in the case of the United States, um, some people may have heard that there's a narrative that's going around that uh, the United States of America was founded on Judeo-Christian roots. Um, that idea of being associated with being a Judeo-Christian country, um, which has a specific interpretation of a type of Christianity or types of Christianity that play a role in the founding, the establishment, and the current condition of the United States is an important thing to pay attention to because that language has also been taken as an opportunity to say that we are a Christian nation, even though we rule under the function of a separation of church and state, and therefore have to deal with the reality that if there is an influence of Christianity, where do we see it? And if people see us as a Christian nation now, how does that impact how we understand the creation of law, the execution of law, and the judgment of interpretation of law? Um, which goes into the point of legal preference of one worldview or the, over the other. You know, for example, banning outward representations of faith while allowing a dominant one the exception to the rule. Um, we actually see this in a variety of different cultural contexts. But one that's always very interesting to a lot of folks is what people are observing right now in France. France observes secular nationalism as an idea. Um, and politically speaking, there's this idea of a deep separation of church and state, but there are now, you know, there's now a push for a precedent that says, oh, when we mean this sort of separation, we are also saying that we do not want to have a present understanding of an outward representation of diverse faith traditions, which has led to things like the banning of headdresses or any sort of um, physical manifestation of your faith practice, such as a hijab for Muslims, a kippah for Jews, a cross being worn around the neck by certain Christian traditions, or turbans being worn by Sikhs. Um, and that kind of represents a very... Um, hardline sort of approach to saying that however you practice you your faith, you keep to yourself and you keep in your home. Um, and that is impacting a lot of minority communities that live in the country. Um, other examples, uh, claims of belonging or ownership that supersede the claims of others. Um, you know, this understanding of your relationship to a land and the role that it plays for you and for others that are on it. Um, and when there is this idea that there's something you own versus something that you steward, um, we've seen that historically in conversations around land in the United States where um, we, we, of those who come from persuasions that understand the indigenous relationship to these lands and the stewardship role that they play, differs from a lot of the narratives that come out of Christian national contexts that actually say that there's an interpretation of biblical scripture that actually speaks to us having dominion over lands and therefore the precedent that was set by the founders and those who continue to claim land in the name of the United States have full right ownership and therefore don't need to feel bad or guilty for what they do with their resources. 
Um, other examples include the use of disinformation to target minority communities as scapegoats for growing problems in society. We see that, unfortunately, at this moment with the growth of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia due to the impending and growing crisis of what's happening in Israel and Palestine. Uh, we see this as the call of po politicians or political parties to marginalize, target, or attack minority communities. And we also see this as uh, threatening the choice of conversion versus violence, where we often see that in more authoritarian circumstances where um, there are very strict rules around this understanding of how you choose to practice your religion and how it relates to the land that you live on. And in not in all cases do you have the guarantee of safety of being a minority person from a tradition to be able to practice it inwardly or outwardly in certain countries. And it's very important to recognize why it looks so different everywhere and why it has a lot to do with the nature of one's majoritarian relationship of government to religion and politics and a government's relationship to its minorities and the way that you engage with them. Both of those things are really essential to this conversation and why it is becoming a part of a large conversation here in the United States, especially going into the 2024 election. So I'd like to play a video. It's very short, I think no more than two minutes, um, from uh, Amanda Tyler, who is the executive director of the Baptist Joint Committee on Religious Liberty. Um, she has been called to testify in front of Congress to interview for a variety of different um, spaces to talk about the specific threat of Christian nationalism in the United States um, and to talk about it in the context of a collective that's been started called Christians Against Christian Nationalism. Um, so I'm going to let you all listen to this for a bit and we'll go into our first bit of discussion as we lead into more of this conversation. The single greatest threat to religious liberty in the United States today, and thus our reputation as leaders in the fight for religious liberty to the rest of the world, is Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism is a political ideology and cultural framework that seeks to fuse American and Christian identities. Christian nationalism seeks to privilege Christians and Christianity in law and policy. We see what happens when religious nationalism in a country is allowed to flourish and use the power of the state to attempt to force a set of religious beliefs or create only one accepted form of religious belief. To oppose Christian nationalism is not to oppose Christianity. In fact, a growing number of Christians, and I am one of them, feel a religious imperative to stand against Christian nationalism. More than 35,000 Christians have signed their names to a unifying statement of principles at the heart of the Christians Against Christian Nationalism campaign, which includes this language, quote, conflating religious authority with political authority is idolatrous and often leads to the oppression of minority and other marginalized groups, as well as the spiritual impoverishment of religion. We must stand up to and speak out against Christian nationalism, especially when it inspires acts of violence and intimidation, including vandalism, bomb threats, arson, hate crimes, and attacks on houses of worship against religious communities at home and abroad, end quote. It's deeply alarming that a member of the U.S. House of Representatives openly identifies as a Christian nationalist. Yet all of us who care about religious freedom should be able to quickly and definitively reject Christian nationalism. Oh, the single greatest. No, nope. trying to skip that. There we go. So we come into this first part of our, our conversation here of how does the URI network address this topic? And what are the boundaries and challenges that make it hard to address this topic? There's so much that we need to consider here as we navigate just a lot of heavy information, but it's such an important reason why it's good for us to be able to engage it as communities who are impacted by our governments, who are impacted by this conversation around religion and spirituality in how we engage this work. So 
let me stop sharing right now so that we can jump into a bit of a conversation right here. I know there's probably a lot to process and a lot of questions as well, um, but I'm happy for us to be able to engage it in the small group that we're in right now. Well, I'll just jump in uh, at the beginning and say that the presentation was very good. Uh, and I was especially uh, watching because I'm very concerned about the nuance, uh, and, and you were you you were, were very good at saying there are situations where nationalism has a negative connotation, and there are situations where it has a positive connotation. And I think that as uh, interfaith peacemakers, that uh, we understand the danger of labels when uh, when identifying groups. It can misidentify groups. It can give, bring wrong understanding, but it can also be a point of pride. Uh, so uh, I'm really glad to have seen the nuance that you brought into the presentation. Thank you for that, Patrick. I appreciate it. I think it was a it was a fundamental part, I think, of of my learning about religious nationalism as well, sort of personally and from just the way that we have different conversations about it around the world um, because it has such a, a, a uniting force. And it's how we focus on that uniting force that can become a very positive thing or how it can become a really negative thing. Um, and, you know, as someone who comes from religious backgrounds that happen to be, you know, having these conversations about a form of nationalism in some way or the other, and then also observing it in uh, as a part of the conversation here in the American ethos, I think it's so important that we are really tackling sort of our, our deeper, you know, ethereal connection, our emotional connection to our faith traditions, and also seeing how people can misconstrue it and misinterpret it and weaponize it into something as well. Um, so I think it's so important that we're trying to, to strike the balance of those complexities there. So thank you, Patrick. Biff, Noel, uh, Reverend Noel, uh, Felipe, welcome. Glad you you were able to make it. Uh, you missed my presentation part, but I'll be sure to right. share the presentation along with the video so that people are able to see both, no problem. Um, but Biff, yes, please. I'm uh, I'm just listening at this point. Um, I uh, I th I think clearly it you know. The United States, which talks about not having any religious presence, is sort of getting some some states like Tennessee. We just learned as uh, where religious nationalism is a huge issue, and I think it's the Christian right um, uh, is concerned to a lot of people. That's not in my mind. It's not what America is about. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that, and that's such an interesting point, right? It's, it's, it's a bit your interpretation of what America is about, which can see, be seen in its way as patriotism and nationalism that is faced off against this different interpretation, which has a deeper, different sort of connection to religiosity and the role that people feel they play as a part of the same experiment that we call America too. Um, and so that is just, that's why I wanted to have this conversation with folks because we're sitting at such an interesting tipping point right now about this. Well, when, in America, we talk about accepting everybody, but some of our leaders are saying we don't, we can't. Right, 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 exactly. Reverend Uelta or yeah, uh, Reverend yeah. Uelta, then no. Uh, Thank you so much, Sharma. You give a wonderful talk, and also presentation is a very, very marvelous and good. And uh, no doubt, uh, since long, this nationalism is coming, but now we have to uh, uh, tie up with the way you tie up. That is uh, wonderful. Thank you. And uh, one thing at the last when that lady, Christian against Christian, mm -hmm. and Muslim against Muslim, even, even 
even we are sometimes I see as uh, maybe you will uh, uh, know my concept when we say to the Christians mm-hmm. when the Muslims are accepting our poor holy books and they respect we have to give a respect to them mm-hmm. their traditions and also then they will probably they will give us respect if you don't give the respect to other religion if you if we say only my religion is a good only that's not fair at all this is the problem of the clergy mm-hmm. if that clergy will teach them that all religions are humanitarian grounds and these are all human beings we have to that faith is my faith and your faith is your faith it doesn't mean that my faith is a super so what uh, this is impact that uh, if we think that the my uh, uh, religion my traditions are super then it's these things will be coming mm-hmm. again and again so thank you thank you reverend you also noel oh i have a question for uh biff uh do you live in tennessee No, but uh, I think Bob Bob was talking about what's going on in Tennessee. I live in California. Okay. I don't know if um, I had to get on another call, so I don't know what Bob said. But uh, did he happen to mention that Tennessee, uh, our governor just signed into law about the Bible? Yes. The Aiken yes. Bible? Yeah. But in fairness, along with nine other works, including George Washington's farewell address and Alex Haley's Roots. But, mm. you know, and I don't know if he talked about what went on at our church this morning, but uh, no. we're part of a UU congregation. And a year ago at our annual meeting, uh, it was voted that uh, the American flag has no business in our um, sanctuary, you know, to be displayed inside or outside of uh, our church. And uh, mm. it was voted down, um, you know, You know, I think it was over, I don't know, 80% of the people said no to having the flag there because so many people, oh, sorry, yeah, you Unitarian Universalist, uh, because so many people feel that the flag isn't representing them. You know, we're open to everyone, you know, and, and in this area of the country, if you're uh, gay, transgender, a uh, person of color, uh, you have to tread very lightly, let's just say. So uh, it was voted down last year and it was brought up again this year, the same person bringing it up. So we had to go mm. through the whole, you know, the Unitarian Universalists, if you don't know, are very democratic. Everything <laughs> gets voted on. And uh, so we had to go through this this whole process again and restate, you know, this this whole divide, you know, between separation be, between uh, church and state, it's getting so muddled. And I think that's part of the plan, you know, in this Christian nationalism movement that we just want to, you know, our, our church is just saying, we don't want to be a part of that. We want to come here, want everyone to wel- be welcomed. And, um, you know, in one of our churches, I think it was um, 2009, a Unitarian Universalist church in Knoxville, about two hours away, a gunman came in and killed people. So Mm -hmm. we live in an area that we have to be very careful about even displaying a pride flag, you know? So, um, you know, that's why I was really interested in this topic, uh, tell you, you know, that you brought it and you're so eloquent. I'm telling you, this guy is. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I'm just going to call you professor from now on. Oh, But, uh, no, don't do that. I, I have never had any interest in joining <laughs> academia, please. Well, But thank you. I appreciate it. I, I, yeah. I agree with you on that. But it is, uh, you know, this is also the state that, you know, that uh, we have the bust of the founder uh, of the KKK, the first um, Klan wizard um, in the in the capital. So the historic mm. commission had it removed and then the legislator fired them all. Oh. Wow. We also have, if you aren't familiar with the town, the term sundowner towns, or if you're a person of color and you're in the town after dark, your life is in danger. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I just want to be a part of whatever can cure this ill 
of yes. not seeing the light in each other. And right. it, it challenged me all the time. You know, they go, well, why, did, why are you in Tennessee? Well, that's where the universe put us for a long story, but that's why we're here. So um, anyway, I just really appreciative of this topic and everyone's contribution. So thanks for letting me talk. Oh, thank you, Noel. We appreciate your contribution and getting to talk about more of your context, because I think for for all of us, that's that's an essential part to why we're engaging here. This is about the work that you all do locally um, and how it can impact a larger national and international fabric. Um, and I think it's so important to talk about that in the context of URI, too, because, you know, URI acknowledges itself as a network and it acknowledges as itself as an um, an apolitical, you know, nonprofit organization. We do not meddle in the conversation of politics. Uh, but talking about religious nationalism, which, you know, I never tend to shy away from these kinds of topics because I am annoying, to say the least. Um, but I, it's it's important to kind of examine the relationship that we have as a nonpartisan apolitical organization to the context of talking about things like religious nationalism and the role that they play in politics and society, um, especially because we are we are almost seeing sort of an emergence of an, it, not an interreligious nationalism, but a multi-religious nationalism, where people who are claiming and weaponizing different traditions are claiming nationalist tendencies for not necessarily the most positive ends. Um, and I'm kind of curious what people's thoughts are about trying to engage this topic in more interfaith spaces. What do you find to be like challenging or difficult about it because of the complex nature of the topic? Okay, I'll jump in again. Uh, the uh, For a long time, I have been interested in the doctrine of discovery, uh, which is for those who don't know, series of papal bulls that uh, uh, allowed Christians to go take land, kill, enslave anyone that was not Christian. So this was justification for uh, uh, religious wars with Muslims. It was justification for the African slave trade. It was justification for the indigenous uh, population uh, here in the United States being reduced in their lands to, taken from them. Uh, and those documents, while the Catholic Church has finally disavowed those doc that doctrine as a teaching of the church, nevertheless, it still exists as the framework for international law that sets up the modern nation states. It's absorbed into the United States itself, the uh, in, in through Supreme Court law, you can uh, and uh, this. So this idea of Christian nationalism, uh, we we have um, a, a, an interesting tension because we've got Sp here in California because we have a history of Spanish Catholics who are in conflict with New England Anglo Protestants, and there's more of this desire for the separation of church and state from the side of the Protestants because of that history than on the side of the, Sp uh, on the Spanish and the Catholics. Uh, and I think that, again, bringing nuance at the time of the founding of the United States there were many different groups and there wasn't a monolithic idea of a separation between church and state. There was competing viewpoints and I, and those competing viewpoints continue to exist to this day. I did an article for, uh, I am unlike to heal willing to, to engage with the Academy. And so I've written a number of articles for the American Academy of religion, including one on religious liberty, religious freedom. Uh, and uh, it was interesting to look at the different, say, schools of thought around 
this idea of separation of church and state. Some groups want that because it protects the state from the church. Some groups want that because it protects the church from the state. Some, some, some want it to be very hard. Some think that there needs to be a blend so that different civic ends can be met. So there's an interesting uh, 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 nuance there. Here in my small town of Pescadero, I serve on our municipal advisory council I also speak occasionally at the church. The building of the church building is a national historic landmark because it was the it's a particular kind of architecture. It, uh, it was the oldest structure on the coast. So, and we don't have very many community facilities. So, the the municipal advisory council meets in the church. And I like to make the joke that I know where the wall of separation between church and state is, because in the front of the church building is the church, and in the back is the state, and the wall of separation is right there in the middle, in between. I make the joke about it, but it's something to think about, because even in our Constitution of California, I'm paraphrasing, but essentially the preamble of the of the Constitution, which is very similar to many of the other states, is we the people establish the Constitution to secure and perpetuate the blessings of liberty, which come from God. So there's three parties in the contract. There's the people, there's the constitutional government, and there's God. And, and the Constitution exists to secure and perpetuate a gift that comes from God, according to the Constitution. That's a very it, it, interesting framework and uh, uh and i have had long conversations with our county supervisor's office about it and uh, it turns out that our county supervisor's chief of staff organized all of the clergy before she was the chief of staff she organized all of the clergy in the county for interfaith action and cooperation so we have somebody right in our county supervisor's office who understands the power of interfaith, but also uh, uh, action, but also needs to serve the secular functions of the government. Um, and even though we're living in a place supposedly as progressive as California, in this small town, we have people who have torn the pride flag down from the from the uh, bulletin board that where it hangs outside of the post office during Pride Month. We've had people who are terrified that migrant farm workers are going to come here and kill and rape people, and uh, and and people who do not understand that we still have indigenous population that lives here and has no clue from, from those perspectives. So uh, uh, in, in this small town, uh, we have, it comes up. We're not immune from it because we're not in Tennessee. It, 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 it exists right here, so close to San Francisco, Rainbow City, the way I think of it, right? And we, we're just 45 minute drive maybe from, from San Francisco. And these, these tensions, do exist here in this small town and it's something that from the side of being a minister from the side of being a town councilor you know i'm just trying to to have people unite peace justice and live in a compassionate community it's a challenge And such an important perspective for you to bring, Patrick, because, you know, with the multiple forms of leadership that you hold, and I think with the deeply local context that you speak of, I mean, this is where much of the work, I think, is so essential to this conversation. Um, we keep getting, I think, often we have to focus on sort of local growth to make global impact, right? Right. And oftentimes we may feel bogged down because much of what's happening nationally and internationally seems so overwhelming and seems to make it as though our local work doesn't have the impact we're looking for. 
And sometimes that's where we need to think about how sort of our small pawns are making the waves necessary so that it hits sort of the national front. Um, and it has to be done in such multiplied, multi-pronged ways that oftentimes it can feel overwhelming, but it's like we're, we're already engaging in this conversation without naming it by actually doing the work of interfaith cooperation. Because we are, we are standing at this front where nationalists of so many different kinds who have sort of this negative connotation associated with them because they have an interpretation that their group ethnically, their group religiously are the only folks that should be living and thriving or, you know, doing what they're doing. And in reality, the work of multiracial, interfaith, intersectional cooperation is an immediate response to that. Um, and it begs a larger question of like, what does that mean to be a part of that larger response of all of these groups that are called cooperation circles in our network who are responding to this accordingly? Um, and I'd like to actually give um, the platform to Felipe if he would like to ask a question or pose any perspectives about things. Welcome. Um, thank you. And sorry that I joined in so late. Hi, everyone. My name is Felipe. Um, I'm located in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that like, to me, brings a little bit of frustration when we're talking about, um, you know, this like nationalism with religion and everything is that, you know, you are in this case, in spe specifically you in this case, Tahil, you know, you are hosting this space for us to have this discussion, to learn a little bit more, to understand how can we, you know, defeat that kind of like toxic ideology that is going on around and not only in the states but in other countries as well you know it's a different religion maybe but there is this predominance of using religion with nationalism and how they can transform that and to me the frustrating part is that i feel like in interfaith spaces we get that we understand that christian nationalism and other religions with nationalism are a danger to to everything in, in reality right um and so how can we have these conversations or bring to the table those religions, those people that are very much in the Christian nationalism movement and even have a conversation to like discuss history, you know, like how come the U.S. people left the U.S. to come I mean, left England to the U.S. to have freedom of religion and, you know, to have that situation. So, but those people are not, those are the ones that do not want to engage. And so to me, that comes the the frustrating point of like, okay, we are, we're trying to do, we're trying to do the best that we can. It seems like the actual true believers of of whatever religion you are would be interfaith because they understand that the, the way that we believe is the way that somebody else could believe and it's completely fine and that's the golden rule and we see it everywhere. But how do we bring to the conversation those people that we're actually trying to reach and to, to show them like how, how big of an issue Christian nationalism is, in this case, in the American context, how dangerous it is to have Christian nationalism. And, and that to me is one of the things that like keeps challenging my thinking when I'm trying to think about how can we create better influence, even if your eyes not political, but like, you know, have an influence politically to show people like, okay, this, this are people that you should vote for or not vote for, but like, you know, who are supporting what? So yeah, I feel like um, I tend to get a little frustrated trying to see how can I bring to this conversation the people that need to hear this conversation. That frustration is so real, so authentic. And um, there's a lot that comes to mind with what you're saying, but I'm going to let Biff speak first. You know, it, it's interesting. I used, you know, traveling around the world with URI and uh, visiting other parts of the world where religion is very much a, a part of who you are. Um, I used to I used to say you know America is different, um, and so uh, so URI is URI relevant to you are to uh, the United States, and I I'm realizing over the last couple of years it's critically important what URI does, bringing people together uh, to do you know a common deal of, with common issues, developing the personal relationship. And then be able to talk appreciative in an appreciative way of people's religion. I think that's more important in America than ever. I mean, we're sort of a mess, and we're not talking. And I think URI creates a platform 
that enables people to talk about difficult subjects in an appreciative way. Um, so, Tahil, I think your job trying to coordinate, you know, all of North America is impossible and more important than ever. Uh, I think what URI does is critically important in the United States as it is in most other parts of the world where religion is a is an even bigger issue. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that into perspective, Biff, because I think it it serves as one of the responses that I think Felipe is sort of reaching out in terms of the frustrations he's centering, right? It's it's this point that like the spaces are there, the people are there. We have an understanding of how, you know, vital it is to engage on these topics and to try to mitigate them and sort of eradicate this idea that we need to be so clinged on to religious nationalism as a weapon to sort of create an exceptional society. And the fact of the matter is, is when we think about sort of the analysis of using things like appreciative inquiry, getting to know other people's strengths and centering them to sort of achieve a common cause to eradicate a common concern, it becomes so important that we invite people who come from different walks of life to engage with that. But sometimes I feel like the model of being able to do appreciative in inquiry can only be achieved among those who may be most closely adjacent to the idea of having that kind of dialogue. And we're, we're talking about, to your point, um, Biff, this idea that there is this large partisan gap in between, that there are a lot of people who are in this gray area of uncertainty in terms of their body, pol like their politics. And then you have a lot of fringe communities on the sides who just don't know how to navigate sort of working either with the center or with the other side. And in certain ways, URI's model of that kind of engagement through appreciative inquiry is helpful. And in some cases, it's not helpful. <laughs> And what happens is I think we need to be super mindful of, um, you know, who is the target audience of who we're trying to bring in, to your point, Felipe, and how do we then sort of inch out and increment the ways in which we create a more inclusive space for dialogue. We're always going to be with the most adjacent first, those who are involved with us and those who know about us. If they're going to engage, it's going to be a piece of cake to get them engaged. Can we assume that the Christian nationalist who may be involved with some sort of fringe group to deny rights to other people is going to want to engage too? We don't necessarily know. But what we do know is that there are people who come from conservative political parties who are interested in what URI does. And they may be people who we can bring in to have the conversation. There may be very progressive people who are completely secular, atheist, you know, agnostic, and who are involved in political social justice work. And they look at URI and they're like, that seems kind of interesting, but I don't know what I'm going to get out of it. And you invite them in, and then they realize the ways that they can mobilize other community members to get involved. There's a way, I think, to to create those increments to then create a larger radical inclusion that makes it possible. And I think it's it's unfair to jump all the way to the other side and try to create a central conversation with so much conflict and sometimes vitriol that occurs in, in the room, um, which is why we have this sort of understanding of the spectrum of red and blue being purple. Um, because you can only you can only get to the folks on the fence and you can't go much deep into the red or to the blue to try to bring people in because they will typically refuse. And I think we have that same argument with many folks who also have different interpretations, either politically or socially, with their religious traditions. Um, if I invite a person from the UU community who's super liberal and I go to someone that might be Pentecostal and say, oh, do you want to have a conversation about the LGBTQ community? Like it's it's not even worth a coin toss to see if it's possible sometimes. it may There may be the rare occasion that it does. And there may be the rare occasion that that person may have a different way of thinking in trying to create a more inclusive society. But that's not going to be the guaranteed outcome, and it's not going to be the guaranteed approach. And I think this is where we're kind of in an interesting point right now in 2024 with URI, 
of what position do we play in all of this, in the role of trying to help create a society where it, it's not just about engagement of the issue in conversation, it's at large trying to address it and see what needs to be you know, promoted and evolved versus what needs to be eradicated. Um, Patrick. Uh, this problem that has been brought up of the, with the frustration of how do you engage at, uh, um, you know, it's not just how does you or I engage, but how do each one of us engage in our daily interactions with everybody? Okay. And um, I'd like to make the suggestion that the nuance that we brought to these terms it can work to our benefit. Hmm. We can actually set a better e example for people to follow, if they if they identify in a certain way, maybe they have an immature or unripe understanding. Maybe they've got a mental disturbance that is typical of fanaticism and extremism. But that there's that that phrase I preach the gospel and sometimes I use words. You know, uh, uh, I think that it's really important that okay, Christian nationalism as a Christian, Jesus taught not just love your neighbors, Jesus taught, love your enemies. And that's, uh, and, and so the, the, uh, as a Christian, for example, to say, to, 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 to exhibit compassion, to, uh, to exhibit uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the love of justice, to be a peacemaker, blessed are the peacemakers. To to exhibit that and to and so it it, it it's a some this Christian nationalism, the Christian part of it suddenly takes on a positive spin. And same thing with the nationalism, we, you know, the the beauty of our system here is the uh, is the democratic process the aspiration for liberty the aspiration for uh for equality and to elevate those things emphasizing the positive rather than trying to handle the negative it sets the example that uh that i think uh, is more persuasive than trying to convince somebody that they're wrong by focusing on the positive rather than the, the pathology. And mm -hmm. we have to understand there's so many things that have, you know, that have taken on, that have been corrupted, good ideas that have been corrupted by misunderstanding, ignorance and confusion, et cetera. For example, I am a Vedantist. And so we have a Sanskrit word, Aryan. Aryan is associated with the white nationalists and white supremacy, but the word in Sanskrit originally meant noble, gentleman, this kind of thing, something that was a very good idea that got corrupted. And now if you use this word, you have to do all kinds of qualifications so that people understand that you're not talking about the corruption. Same thing with the swastika. Originally, for thousands of years, a very beautiful symbol uh, that, uh, you know, mathematically, if you spin it, it's a 16 uh, uh, point cross that creates a uh, 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 vertical axis, horizontal axis, depth, and you, and you get the whole thing. Uh, and, and, but then a group of people in a nationalistic way use that symbol and now this the the beautiful symbol has been corrupted and if and people could misunderstand that that symbol same as the word so i think the best thing to do always is to emphasize the positive set the better example so and and and, and if you have the encounter with these people focus on that that's that's uh, that's uh, where i think that there's the possibility Make them a better Christian. Make them a better American, rather than saying you're wrong, you're bad, you're evil. This is this is dangerous to the country. 
really set up the positive example for them it, it is it, you know perhaps it's idealistic but i'm that kind of guy <laughs> <laughs> no that's that's very appreciated and i think it's it's uh, those are two really really good examples um because in the grand scheme of things much of much of what takes root around this um this embellishment of feeling better about you and your community comes from this idea that, you know, on many occasions, when you are in, in certain circumstances that are not beneficial, you are looking for a scapegoat. You are looking for something to justify, why am I in this situation? Um, and you could be of, of, of a better, you know, viewpoint to say that there are multiple things that control the circumstance. And oftentimes it's this use of authoritarianism, of nationalism that says, no, that one thing over there is your scapegoat. That one community is what's caused all of this. This one idea has done everything. And that one takes away nuance, but two, makes it much easier actually to think about why something is going on, which is why so many people latch onto the idea, unfortunately. Um, and I think it's so true. I think the biggest and best response that we can give to, you know, this kind of religious nationalism that is feeling emboldened right now to do the worst of the worst through, you know, weaponizing religion is by responding with interfaith pluralism. This dynamic engagement that calls all of us through our various traditions together to say, to say we can solve problems because we're called in different ways to actually do the same things. Um, I think is such an essential part of this. And, you know, I'm, I'm always very mindful of a, of a story that I experienced personally uh, back in 2017, I want to say, uh, which was, um, it was the one year anniversary of the San Bernardino terrorist attacks. Um, there was a couple who had taken a certain claim of how they interpreted Islam and they went into this medical facility and attacked a number of people that had, that were killed. Um, a year later, um, there was a memorial that was supposed to take place there, but this memorial brought in hundreds of people who were demonizing Islam and all Muslims that were actually demonizing refugees and asylum seekers. It was throwing everyone under the bus who was foreign born. It, it became... It became a catalyst for a lot of vitriol that um, I decided to go counter protest. Um, this was well before I, I was aware of URI as a thing. And I was deeply involved as a community organizer on the ground in that way. And we were, we were almost attacked by dogs. We had bottles thrown at us. We had people carrying large crosses saying that this is a Christian nation. Um, very literal examples of what this nationalism can look like. And I remember a lady who walked across the street towards me um, and she was standing there and making fun of us with a little dog that she had. And I would not recommend this approach, but it's an approach I took. I actually went up to her and I asked her if I could pet her dog because I thought it was cute. Uh, and she was immediately confused because she was like, okay, sure, I guess. And the dog was getting nervous. There was a lot of commotion. So we, we played with the dog. We let it calm down, let it feel comfortable. And I told her, you know, this dog understands more about love than I think all of us do at this point. She responds by saying, well, to be fair, it's a dog and it has a small brain so it can't think for itself. <laughs> And I said, okay, well, that's a way to start this conversation. Um, so I started actually engaging with her and trying to understand where where her, her mind is. Where does her worldview sit with all of this? So she talked about the research that she did about 9-11 and about Sharia law and all of these very deep assumptions about Muslims and the, and, and the religion of Islam. And I said, oh, then you must know for sure from all of this research that you've done that Sharia law doesn't look the same anywhere. Uh, and she said, what are you talking about? I said, well, Sharia is interpreted in so many different ways. There's the Sharia of the individual, which is one's personal struggle in trying to navigate life. There's the Sharia of countries which if they are Muslim majority, have certain responsibilities to minorities. 
And there's also the Sharia that a person must practice in the law of the land that they live in, which means if any Muslim identifies as an American, they follow the rule of law of the Constitution and the laws that are here in the United States. That is that is the precedent that Islam sets. And she's like, well, I didn't know that. None of that didn't come across in my research. And, you know, the thoughts that come to your mind are like, well, ma'am, if you go to islamisevil.org, I don't expect you to come up with the most unbiased information. <laughs> um, but that's when you start actually doing a very important process, which makes us think about what we should be doing as we engage in these topics, is how do you help people who are of these opinions help to deconstruct and find the origins of where they get their information, which is so important in how we engage in this work of trying to trying to really combat this thing that we call religious nationalism when it's weaponized for the negative. How are we helping people think about their relationship to their faith, to their scriptures, and their interpretation to other folks as it comes into the context of that? So I sat with her and I said, you know, you're standing here trying to make fun of us. Like, do you know what we stand for? And she's like, yes, you all stand for Sharia. You want to um, you want to kill all the infidels. I'm like, ma'am, there's a lot you're trying to say here that like, I understand you're frustrated, but my frustration is mutual with you because first you assumed I'm Muslim just on my skin color. I haven't told you what my religion is. And I think you need to take a couple steps back before you go on the assumption train. But secondly, like if you're frustrated with pain and suffering, don't think anyone here doesn't recognize there's pain and suffering in the world. There were innocent people that were killed by an attack by people who were completely misled. And there are Muslims on the side who are saying that and agreeing that justice should be served. But you're also not recognizing the vitriol that is existing to larger groups of people that are innocent, that have nothing to do with terrorism, who you're also putting under this umbrella. And I had her, from our perspective, look at the side that she walked from originally, which was demonizing Islam, saying that Islam is un-American, uh, uh, calling, calling refu refugees rapists and that they should be deported, and all of these really terrible things. And I asked her, ma'am, do you believe any of what they say, anything of what they say on those signs? And she's like, no, I don't at all, actually. And I'm like, do you see why we're frustrated too? <laughs> because you're making assumptions of communities because you're just drawing parallels to things that don't exist. And that was one of the few times in my life where a person actually apologized to me for their views and said that they are going to reevaluate and actually go back to talk to some people to change their views about what they're saying and doing. And it's, it is a unique example among unique examples. And there's much possibility that comes with it. I don't always recommend it because of the nature of that kind of engagement, which can be dangerous. But that means that there are possibilities to help people navigate through these complexities in a really heart-to-heart -heart way. And I think that's something that is a strong suit in the URI network with so many of the CCs that are involved. I think there is this heart-to-heart -heart connection that we build on that I think oftentimes just focuses on the shared values, which I think is essential, and I think needs to expand to better understanding why is this difference so important and essential to this mosaic that we call URI. We are not aiming for a oneness that leads to sameness. We're leading for a oneness that reminds us of how valuable diversity is. And I think there's a lot of important structure and thinking there that I think we should all think of as regional coordinators, staff people, trustees, and all of you as groups on the ground who are doing this work so, you know, consistently. Um, and I know we have about five minutes, of course, but I, I want this to be sort of maybe a time of thinking about what could this work look like for us going forward? It's not a lot of time. And I'm happy to, you know, re-invite you all to a bigger conversation about this with more folks, hopefully, because I think it's going to be more relevant as we go forward. I, yeah. My suggestion is trauma-informed. That one of the things that this this kind of, of let's call it primitive, uh, attitude comes forward because people are traumatized. They're scared. They feel unsafe. 
They need mm. compassion. They need care. And so in the future, if we could have some mm. trauma-informed sessions so that people can understand the neuroscience of the uh, of that that goes behind these kinds of extremist views mm. Mm. that's a uh, that's a really great suggestion thank you for that patrick you will sub uh, yeah uh, uh it's a wonderful uh, conversation and i'm learning a lot of things and uh, what i know that uh, you are a ppp ppp and uh, bn of that is a very interesting and uh, when they frame out these all things uh, that is a really marvelous and uh, what i can say that uh, if the political forces and the religious forces sit together and i think that can, can be a pull down some some oh you see in these days uh, in uh, due to uh, Palestine, Gaza and Israel war in pakistan there is a very uh, uh much uh, concentration concentration so because they they, they think that uh, they are the muslim country that is a muslim country and uh, if there is a christian a hindu sikh they are not uh, muslim so now they are focusing that israel target the uh, that uh, in that war and everything which is a very very bad thing we put some seeds wherever we can and uh, recently in 17th april um, we had a, a wonderful uh, gathering over there in the church we had a easter and uh, uh, eid milan uh, eid fellowship fellowship that uh, that message was gone uh, very good good message was gone to that uh, from church they uh, they invite the muslim people they invite the muslim we we uh, we have uh, inaugurated a uh, launch and opening ceremony of another uh, group yes peace promoter pakistan it's a interfaith organization what uh, i i will be running from here but anyway it's my bn and calling that we should go further in hans the everything through the grassroots level this is a way only the grassroots level so if if i go to the past go to go to my past journey in pakistan we always invite uh, all religion uh, leaders in the conferences and uh, workshop of the uri and i have not hesitate to invite all the sikh uh, all the sects i mean shia in uh, uh, shia sunni wahabi and then catholic then protestant then uh, that other things so we have to um, although we are many thing we are aware but we have to explore this way through our social media through our reporting through our good and today uh, this uh, conversation is a very very good thank you so much for everyone and uh, dr patrick i i love the your uh, wonderful talk <laughs> thank you <laughs> Thank uh, you, one thing, sorry, sorry, one thing more. Gigi. On uh, May 1st, we are celebrating humanity. Celebrating for humanity. And uh, May 1st is a uh, Labor Day from, in the, some part of the world. And that is also Global Love Day. So we will celebrate that. I have sent you uh, that fly. If you were, uh, that will be good. That. if someone come and uh, they can uh, i mean uh, circulate to the others so can you uh, share on me or that uh... ji well sir thank you so much for that and thank you for the invitation uh, for celebrating humanity um uh, in this last minute or so would any others like to share anything or add any suggestions it's all right if we don't all good i, okay. I just want so, can you can you uh, can comment. you screen shot that uh, uh, fly that i sent to you oh at this moment um i don't have it accessible on my um thing but i will be sending that out today for all all right thank you thank yeah. you thank you ulsab yes no of course i mean i don't speak from any 
a scientific point of view, but my just personal experience here in Tennessee is that I think a lot of Christian nationalists don't go to church. <laughs> so I know, of, you know, a lot of people that I meet that are church going around here and very conservative, whatever, you know, I, I've never really experienced with them. But when I'm in the, you know, pride parade or I'm in, you know, walking with the Democrats or something like that, it's some people that, uh, you know, I don't know where they're coming from, someplace out in the mountains, but they're not the people I see going to, to church necessarily. So it's kind of like, I think being Christian nationalism, it, I know it is being promoted very heavily in, in, in some churches, but it's not just a church thing. It's more of a political thing than a church thing. So that's all I got to say. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful chats. Thank you for that. Very important point, Noel. Appreciate it. Uh, Biff, Felipe, did you want to add anything? I don't know if our sister has fallen asleep in Pakistan, but... <laughs> I want to hear more from Felipe, yeah. Nothing, I think I mean, I think that, you know, the, uh, the, the weaponizing of Christianity onto this, you know, kind of like using that identity to really make the political situation that you were talking about, Arnoel. Um, when, if conversations happen like you know the one that, the one that you had to help you know so when we are talking to people because yes I mean you know, you know we'll come across those people we cannot can remind them as well that we are also being patriotic that we also because we care so much about you know this country mm -hmm. we are thinking this way so to kind of like try mm -hmm. to get into common ground and I think that's mm -hmm. important and everyone and that mentioned you know those things especially compassion and I know that is you know, being able to see each other in each other's eyes and see each other, you know, like mm -hmm. it's important. So, so thank you for the conversation. Yeah, interfaith pluralism can be a form of nationalism as a part of what we're talking about today. And as long as we keep it with something of positive, inclusive, and, you know, revolutionary connotation, 100%, 100%. Nasrinji, if you want to say something in Urdu, you can say it if you feel Just letting her know if she wants to say something in Urdu, she could be more comfortable doing that and I can translate. Oh, yes. Actually, uh, she's uh, sleepy. She's sleepy, okay. I want to say something in Urdu. Yes, absolutely. Say it. I was asleep very much. और मैं चाहती हूं थोड़ा सा कुछ बोलना आप लोगों की बातें मैं सुन रही थी बहुत अच्छी-अच्छी लेकिन मैं तो इस काबिल नहीं हूं कि मैं इतना कुछ मतलब कर सकूं लेकिन यह कि खुदावन की जो जात है जिस पे मैं भरोसा करती हूं वो कमजोरों को इस्तेमाल करता है वो उन लोगों को इस्तेमाल करता है जो कुछ भी नहीं होते जिनके पास कोई क्वालिटी नहीं होती कोई ऐसी चीज नहीं होती लेकिन वो अपनी क्वालिटी अपनी ताकत अपनी قوت बख्श देता है क्योंकि हमारी बाइबल में लिखा है कि जो मुझे قوت बख्शता है उसमें मैं सब कुछ कर सकता हूं तो ये आयत मैं जानती हूं कि मैं कुछ नहीं हूं लेकिन खुदावन जो जिस पे मैं बिलीव करती हूं वो मुझसे वो सब कुछ करवाएगा जो वो चाहता है और मेरे बहुत से मतलब ऐसी चीजें हैं जो मैं करना चाहती हूं दुनिया के लिए क्योंकि जब आप देखते हैं क्योंकि हम यहां पे जब ट्रेन में सफर करती हूं मैं बहुत ज्यादा ट्रेन में सफर करती हूं लाहौर जाने के लिए क्योंकि वहां पे मेरे पेरेंट्स रहते हैं मेरे बहन भाई तो मैं मुस्लिम्स को बहुत देखती हूं और उनसे मतलब जब भी उनकी कोई बात सुनती हूं तो मैं सिर्फ जस्ट उनका हैंड पकड़ती हूं लेडीज का खास तौर पे और उनको मैं कहती हूं कि मैं आपके लिए प्रेयर करूंगी तो वो फौरन जान जाती हैं कि ये क्रिश्चियन है क्योंकि मुझसे किसी का दुख देखा नहीं जाता किसी के आंसू नहीं देखे जाते हम्म कि कोई दुखी है और मैं स्पेशली यदि उनके लिए प्रेयर करती हूं क्योंकि मेरे पास एक ही वेपन है प्रेयर कि मैं उनके लिए प्रेयर करूं और उनको याद रखूं और उस चीज से मैं उनको निकाल सकूं तो फिलहाल तो यानी मेरे पास ये कि एक ही टूल है प्रेयर का और मैं समझती हूं कि ये एक पावरफुल टूल है हम्म जिसे हम दुनिया को चेंज कर सकते हैं और खुदावन ने जब हमें कहा कि तुम दुनिया के नूर हो तो हमारे पास जो नूर है वो जितना भी है 
वह जहां पर भी हम हैं उस अंधेरे में जब चमकता है तो रोशनी पैदा करता है तो मैं जहां पर भी एग्जिस्ट करती हूँ जहां पर भी होती हूँ मैं कोशिश करती हूँ कि मेरे पास जो इलम है जो मोहब्बत है जो खुदावन ने मुझे दी है वो मैं दूसरों तक पहुंचाऊं दूसरों तक मतलब वो उन तक पहुंचे उन तक जाए और बगैर कहे कि मैं क्रिश्चियन हूँ लोग मुझे पहचान जाते हैं यू आर क्रिश्चियन एंड आई एम प्राउड ऑफ माई सेल्फ क्रिश्चन तो ये पे मुझे अच्छा लगता है कि लोग मुझे क्रिश्चियन समझते हैं और जानते हैं तो ये बात है कि हम अपनी सोसाइटी में बहुत सारी ऐसी नेगेटिव बातें हैं जो हम बर्दाश्त करते हैं लेकिन सबसे पहले मोहब्बत है कोई कुछ भी करता है कोई कुछ भी सोचता है ये उसका फेल है लेकिन हम क्या हैं हमने क्या सीखा है हमने वो करना है और जो हमने सीखा है हम वो करते हैं तो इस सोसाइटी में रहते हुए हम बहुत कमजोर है लेकिन हमारा खुदावन कमजोर नहीं है जो हमारे साथ है जो हमें उठाता है जो हमारी मदद करता है और जो हमें रहने की कुत बख्शता है यहाँ पे पाकिस्तान में रहना क्रिश्चन के लिए सब जानते हैं बहुत मुश्किल है लेकिन लोग बहुत बहादुर हैं वो इस कदर खामोशी के साथ जिंदगी गुजारते हैं किसी को नुकसान पहुंचाए बगैर किसी को कुछ कहे बगैर हर चीज बर्दाश्त करते हैं सब कुछ सहते हैं लेकिन वो शर नहीं फैलाते जी। मतलब के वो ये नहीं करते कि हम जंग करेंगे हम प्रोटेक्ट करेंगे हम इनको वैसा जवाब देंगे या वैसा कुछ करेंगे नहीं नो no. जी।, जी, जी जी वो अपनी मोहब्बत से ही अपनी मोहब्बत से ही सारों को मतलब करना चाहते हैं फतेह करना चाहते हैं विक्ट्री हासिल करना चाहते हैं जहां पर भी है वो अपनी मोहब्बत से अपने करेक्टर से अपनी बातों से ही लोगों को ये नहीं करना चाहते हैं तो कोई भी ऐसा उनके पास ताकत नहीं है कि वो दुनिया को बदल सके या लोगों को बदल सके या सोसाइटी को बदल सके लेकिन एक ही चीज उनके पास है खामोशी से मोहब्बत करना खामोशी से बर्दाश्त करना खामोशी से अच्छाई जाना खामोशी से यानी अपने हिस्से की क्षमा जलाना अपने हिस्से का किरदार अदा करना तो ये चीजें मैंने देखी हैं अपने क्रिश्चियन में और मैं प्राउड फील करती हूँ कि हमारे पाकिस्तानी मसीही इतने अच्छे हैं इतने अच्छे तरीके से रहते हैं कि उन्होंने कुछ भी हो जाए कभी भी उन्होंने नेगेटिव नहीं सोचा कि हम ये करते हैं तो ये चीज ही मैं कहना चाहती हूँ कि मैं कुछ नहीं हूँ लेकिन मेरा ईमान है कि जिस पर मैं ईमान रखती हूँ वो मुझसे बहुत कुछ करवाएगा और मैं करना चाहती हूँ हाँ जी बिल्कुल बिल्कुल नसरीन जी आपके रिफ्लेक्शन के लिए बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया um, I I'm going to try to sum it up in the best way possible to sort of end the call today but um, uh, Nasreen ji comes from a Christian community in Pakistan and Pakistan being an Islamic republic you know does not necessarily guarantee the equal rights and protections under the law because uh, because of being a religious minority um but one thing that Nasreen ji sort of emphasized is this idea that like even for being a quiet minority the Pakistani Christian community still has a lot to say and a stronghold in what they do in being able to navigate the work that they do and one of the most important things that she said is sort of this role of silence in a, in the midst of this is is kind of important because um the the minority communities that are religious oftentimes can speak up but they still play an essential role in the work that they do as minorities so when they pray for each other and for those who are in need when they light their part of the fire that helps to bring communities forward when they do their little parts to be able to make a difference they can be recognized accordingly and start to sort of push against the narrative of what you know nationalism can really do and what's in, what's essential as a part of that is she says she comes from a community that doesn't have a lot 
for her as an individual and for her as a religious community too. Um, and that's oftentimes where this narrative of nationalism plays such a significant role. It affects many people who don't have a lot because they can lean on to something that helps them share that they feel that they can be a part of a bigger community. But the fact of the matter is, is for her as being a Pakistani Christian, she is very steadfast in her faith. Um, she knows that she doesn't have a lot, but when she said it herself, sort of quoting the Bible, when you have God, what else do you need? Um, and being able to really lean into this truth that like, as someone who has prayed with others, who has worked with others, who has done whatever she could from the limited, limited places where she is, she's still been able to achieve a lot. And she's very proud of herself and her community for being able to still contribute all of that in the midst of everything. So I think that's a very important part of this way to end the call, which says, you know, we all have a role to play in our responsibility of doing interfaith work to not just respond to the immediate needs of our communities, interfaith and, you know, uh, monoreligious, but also to be able to respond to these larger issues and narratives to say that this is where we draw the line because none of us are free unless all of us are free. And I think that's an important message to take from all of this. So I want to say that as sort of my gratitude to you, Nasrinji, you, Elsa, Felipe, Patrick, all of you have made such important contributions today. And um, I wish everyone the best uh, as we go into this new week uh, with blessings and, you know, all of good energies abound. And please, Nasrinji, sleep well. I know you need it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much. Please take care. Okay, thank you. Sleep well. Thank you so much for joining. You have a lot of